Israeli met with even a hundred thousand million kalpas. Now I can see and hear it, accept and maintain it. May I unfold the meaning of the Tathagata's truth. All right. So th this evening I'll give a talk on, uh, on the enlightenment of the Buddha. And but so but I thought prior to that so this talk I'll talk a little bit about a a text called the Denko Roku the the transmission of light and actually we'll we'll get into that today and tomorrow yeah we'll, we'll use today and tomorrow to talk about that particular that particular text. And I'll, I'll share more about myself this evening, since I, I'm assuming that other pe more people will come. And I'll, go, I'll, I'll share a little bit more about how I came to practice this evening. But for now, I just want to go right into um, this, this book called The Transmission of Light, the Denko Roku. What it is, is, well, first of all, we are, we're sitting this week. We're, you know, some of you have been here since Saturday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Today's Thursday? Mm -hmm. Six days you've been sitting regularly, like all day long, 10 periods, or somewhere in there. And uh, that's pretty remarkable. I just got here yesterday, and, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's an intensive experience to sit that much. And what we're doing is, is uh, remembering the enlightenment of the Buddha. We're honoring the enlightenment of the Buddha. Uh, and that enlightenment, uh, what is it? You know, what are we trying to do? So the, the Buddha, just to say, the Buddha was not a, a god. The wonderful thing about the Buddha and his enlightenment story is that it's all, it's, completely something that's attainable by anybody. And so we don't have to, um, we're not here to, to worship the Buddha. We're not here to bow to the Buddha. I mean, I, I just bowed at the altar. But when, when we bow, it's different from giving praise. It's not, we're not giving praise to something greater than ourselves but we're acknowledging actually the greatness within ourselves. We're acknowledging our own God through the bowing. So physically, physically, we put our bodies into that, you know, into a prostration. And um, my, my teacher, Diane Banaj Roshi, she would often say, the only way to be really, to see or to be really big is to make yourself really small. So we're working with this kind of like this, these opposites. You can only know the great by knowing what is um, right here down on earth. And the same is true for enlightenment. This is, you know, enlightenment um, has to be a grounded experience, not something that is like pie in the sky. It needs to be real, it needs to be manifest in our everyday life. And the transmission of light is, is it, it contains 53 stories of various students of Buddhism, including the Buddha himself. It contains 53 stories and it, and it demonstrates how the, the light of the Dharma was passed on from one generation of teachers and students to the next generation to the next generation and it's about also how the the Dharma has been transmitted from one culture to another culture to another culture and today even more cultures so there's some kind of universal truth that cuts across culture that we're we're getting at Something that, you know, in a, in a society that right now is so divided on so many levels, I mean, political is the most obvious, but on so many other, economically divided, racially divided, 
in a society like ours so divided. I mean, it's, it's really apparent, I think, in our culture how divided we are. And to, to hear a message that there's some universal truths that connect all of us together. There's something that connects us all. Uh, and, and that's what all of these stories are getting at. If nothing else, they're getting at that there's some unify, there's something that unifies all of us that we can, and it's not just an idea, it's something that can be experienced in your through your own senses. And that's why we sit. We sit to open up our senses. That, that's what that Chinese character Satori means. If you look at the character itself, the number it, it contains the number five. The um, the piece for open, and the character for heart or mind, and so those comprise this the five. The five is standing for those five. The five senses: eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and then there the the, the heart mind is the sixth. And then the, the character for to open it just looks like a square almost. So we're opening up our senses. We're opening up our eyes to really see. We're opening up our ears to really hear. Omori Sogen Roshi, the Rinzai Zen master, said that if you really sit deeply enough, you can hear the incense from the, the ash from the incense, the top of that incense stick, drop into the incense holder. If you're really listening, can you hear that? <laughs> but what else can we hear? You know, can, we can hear so much. I mean, it might seem like crazy talk to see it, to think that, oh, I can hear, I can hear that incense ash falling to the incense, to the ash below it. That might seem crazy. But it's not just about what we can hear with our physical ears. So we hear, hear with our, our heart's ear, our, the, the ear of our heart. And can we, can we hear in a sense? Can we hear with our heart's ear? And when we open our, our senses, can we hear uh, not only the the good things that are out there in the world, but also the painful things that we, we may not want to really want to acknowledge. The painful thing, the painful parts of ourself, painful parts of our life, not just our individual life, but, but our society as a whole. Not just our society, not just American society, but our world, our whole planet. Can we hear that? Can we hear the 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 joys but also the sorrows the suffering of this of this whole planet it might seem like a lot to take on so we start with we start with just the basics of sitting here sitting down sitting at our seat and noticing what we notice right here and right now we may not be able to hear the incense we may not be able to hear the cries of the world but maybe just to get back to our own body-mind, just to bring our attention back to the physical sensations in our own body. Just start there. Just start there. We have enough pain right in this one body that we can focus on, or joy as well, right here in this one body. So we just start out. We ground ourselves. And that's why we're sitting so long, is to help us to be grounded. Uh, the thing is, we, a lot of times, I think a lot of people have some kind of an enlightenment experience well before they make it to a Zen center. Has anybody here had some kind of a Satori experience? Like, you realize, whoa, there, I, I'm part of something much vaster, and it's, I'm, I'm integrally part of something much greater than myself. And you really feel that, like, on a physical level, maybe an emotional level, maybe might be a very emotional experience even. You know, and so a lot of times we, we have that, not from sitting, but then, but then once we have that, it, you know, it disappears. It's, it's fleeting. It doesn't last. 
And so um, we wonder, ah, I want to get that back. And that's where the problem starts arising. We, we, we have an experience. We have, a, we have a, some kind of an awakening experience. And then we go back to our regular life and we realize there's such a big, huge separation between what I know is possible, what I experience, and what I am actually living, or how I'm actually living my life right now. There's just a huge gap. And so I think part of our practice here, just sitting, is to re- is to integrate that experience, is to bring it back, bring it back to home, bring it back to reality, to ground ourselves in reality. So these stories, these there's 53 of them, and um, my my teacher, Diane Banaj Roshi, she was. Uh, she shared, uh, you know, we talk about going across cultures. Right now, this is a very monogamous, uh, homogenous, what? Homogenous. This is a very homogenous, <laughs> homogenous group, right? We're all basically uh, white Americans. There's not a lot of diversity right here. But think about what happened just a generation, just a generation ago in, in Zen. You know, in the 1960s and 70s, you have these Japanese teachers, at least in Soto Zen, you have these Japanese teachers coming to the United States and offering, offering um, Buddhism, offering teachings of Zen Buddhism. Um, Kyoki, the, 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 Kyoki's teacher was um, Nonin, and Nonin's teacher was Katagiri Roshi, who was a Japanese Zen master came in the, I think it was in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and so there was a lot of cross-cultural communication taking place at that time that it's kind of somewhat absent from our, our eyes right now. But something really interesting happened there. And, and then in the case of, of my teacher, instead of Japan coming to the United States, the United States went to Japan. You know, she, as an American woman, went to Japan in the 1960s. And she lived there for tw- over, like 23 years. But she didn't go there specifically to study Zen. She went there because she loved the culture. She learned the language. She could speak it fluently. And over a period of 10 years, then she discovered Zen in Japan and started training with a Rinzai Zen master for three years as a lay person. She trained with, and then she found her, uh, a teacher that eventually became her, her root teacher, Norodaito Roshi. And he, uh, so, and he was a Soto Zen master, didn't speak any English, he didn't speak a word of English. She, and she was doing this through her understanding of Japanese and constantly having to translate in her mind what was going on there, like translating it from English into Japanese and trying to communicate that way. And for Katagiri Roshi, he was trying to translate from Japanese into English. What kind of struggle must those teachers have had? And just if any of you have ever, how many of you speak a foreign language? Yeah, a little bit. You know how difficult it is to go back and forth, but at least I don't. I find it really challenging to go back and forth between two different languages, and I'm very limited. But these are teachers that all manage to to be able to kind of do that, do that movement, and and so we see little glimpses of that. It doesn't come out in these stories, though. When um, Bodhi Dharma, the Indian the first, uh, the first Indian Buddhist, or he's credited, well, he's probably not the first, but he's credited with being the first, and we don't even know if he's a real person or not. It doesn't matter. But he goes from India. Somehow, the Dharma went from India to China. And we can, we can say, okay, well, this one person, we, it kind of the, he's the embodiment of the movement of, of the Buddha Dharma from India into a country that's totally foreign. You know, we're going from from uh, an Indian land to a Chinese land. That's pretty different. 
the language is completely different. He didn't probably know Chinese. And he had to work with a student that was Chinese, Taiso Eka. And Taiso Eka probably didn't know Sanskrit. He probably didn't know Hindi. He was working with a teacher that was, was, uh, was Indian. And so they, their complexions were different. You know, maybe uh, Bodhidharma had probably very brown skin. He came from the south of India. Pretty dark skin there. And he's working with somebody Chinese with, you know, very clo almost closed eyes maybe. We don't know. But we can imagine. We can use our imagination. And this is how the Dharma was transmitted from one country to, to the next. And so th this, was an ins these, uh, this story of Taiso Eka was an ins inspiration for, for my teacher in keeping, keeping up her practice. Like, I want to get to understand what is this? And, and to have that question in our mind, it's really important that we come with a sense of curiosity, you know, being curious, like what? And also to have a sense of, uh, you know, when our, our practice is firmly grounded, when we come from a sense of urgency, from a sense of pain, from a sense of suffering, and, uh, Zen Master Dogen says we should practice as though our head were on fire. There's urgency there, you know, and, and that urgency can be really helpful for really cutting through a lot of garbage, our own mental garbage. The other teacher that was really inspiring for my teacher was uh, Daikon Eno, He's the sixth patriarch, and he was said to be illiterate. Couldn't, he couldn't uh, read. And I'm sure that my teacher felt a very similar way, trying to translate in her head all of these Chinese characters. You know? And so it's, these are examples that the, the Dharma can be transmitted not only across cultures, but also it doesn't matter how smart or, or dull-witted we are. You don't have to have a a huge, you don't have to have loads of education. You don't have to have a PhD or a master's degree or, a gra or an undergraduate degree or a high school diploma even. But there's other things that we do need to have. And that is that urgency and that curiosity. That sense of, what is my life about? Why am I here? And for Soto Zen, you know, we, sometimes we think when we talk about this enlightenment, when we talk about enlightenment, we think that I, we come from a place of not having anything and then we're going to get something. We're going to, we're, here we are deluded or somehow deluded. We've lost that enlightenment experience that we had, whatever, Satori experience, we lost it. And now we're going to go get it. We're going to go, we're going to go sit and wake up and find that experience again. But um, actually, it's the reverse. Soto Zen starts out with the assumption that we already have enlightenment. We don't come here to get it. We come here, st that's our starting place. And um, yeah, that's, that's the place that, you know, might. We continue to we continue if you if we're really honest with ourselves, we we oftentimes find ourselves unsatisfied with our life, you know. All of us, me too. We we come and we're we're there's something about our life that just like mm, I, it just rubs us the wrong way, and we can we can con get confused into thinking, well, I must have to do something else to get it right. And what this practice is doing is it's affirming that even in, our, even in our unsatisfactoriness, we can find enlightenment. We, we don't, we've never lost it, actually. But this unsatisfactoriness is, is part of what our life is. That's what, it, and it's okay. So instead of pushing against, trying to resist the discomfort in our life, wherever that might present itself, we are 
allowing ourselves to simply experience it, not try to push it away, but to allow it to simply be there with openness, with curiosity. And with a kind of urgency to find out, what is this about? Not with, the, not with trying to destroy it, but like, what is this? Bringing that question, what is this? So um, one of the reasons why, so in, in Soto Zen, in order for us to really uh, kind of come back home to our own Buddha nature, our own sense of enlightenment, in order to do that, we need to, we need to be well grounded. We need to kind of ground ourselves in the present moment. And so one of the blessings of pain, physical pain or emotional pain, is that when we sit still with it, we can really see how our mind fights. We can really see how our mind turns and tries to escape from what we're experiencing. And simply watching it, watching it, watching it, and using our practice as a means to settle down, to settle back down, and just being, okay, this is where I am right now. And maybe nothing at all changes. Maybe our mind continues to spin. Maybe we still have that pain. I mean, if there's something that you can do to alleviate it, like sitting in a chair versus sitting on the floor, then by all means, go for it. But that doesn't take away necessarily some other kind of underlying pain that's there. And so we're, we're really continuing to investigate that, whatever that is, that, that something that is just kind of off in our life. So one of the reasons that Soto Zen um, kind of de-emphasizes trying to attain some kind of enlightenment experience. You know, the Buddha sat for six years. He sat for eight days, and at the end of the eighth day, he attained enlightenment. That's the sto- that's how the story goes. And we don't necessarily talk a lot about enlightenment. We don't talk about Satori in Soto Zen a lot. Um, And part of that stems from, in the time of Dogen, this is the 13th century Japan, Dogen goes to China, he brings back a whole tradition with him that hadn't even been here before Soto Zen. And there was a a group of of monks in 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 a school called the Dharma School, Dharma Shu, and they had a teacher, ironically named Nonin, and... um, and this was a branch of, of Zen that had started up and they had no connection to China and they emphasized this awakening experience, they emphasized enlightenment. They wanted and the monks felt like they were all enlightened. And um, and and what happened was the that teacher Nonin, he got murdered, and then all of his Students, he had acquired a lot, he had a lot of students, maybe fifteen or twenty students, and they were all now Ronin. They were masterless disciples, and they all gravitated to Dogen. And Dogen, he comes from he comes back from China. He's Japanese. He comes back from China with this particular kind of practice, and he's met with all of these disciples, all these students who are. Who, who consider themselves enlightened. And this is a huge problem for Dogen because uh, if you're already enlightened, there's not very much that you can teach somebody. And if enlightenment is the end product rather than the begin, if enlightenment is the end product, then it's, a, it's kind of like complacency can easily set in, I've got it, I've attained what I need to attain. And so it was a real job, apparently, for Dogen to work with these students. Most of his students came from this particular sect. 
And so a lot of his writing, if you want to understand Dogen's writing, sometimes he comes across really vehemently on certain points, and he seems like this um, like fundamentalist Buddhist, like you do it this way or you're never going to, you know, this is the only way, or things like that. You come across some of his writings like that. He's very, he's very, really hard in some areas. And a lot of it is, is a response to these students who believed that they were, you know, fully enlightened and they had nothing else to learn. And so um, he, Dogen turns, turns enlightenment all the way around. He says, enlightenment isn't the place that we end when we practice. We don't practice in order to attain enlightenment. We start out from enlightenment and then we, that's where we begin. That's the beginning point. That's the beginning point of our practice. It's not the end point. So we all start out that way. This is a sharp contrast, even for, uh, you know, when we contrast that with our Western society, there's a big difference in a certain way. Um, most of us, I'm assuming, have, have some kind of Judeo-Christian background. Particularly if a, you know, I come from a Catholic background, and we start out with this idea that we are we are born with original sin, and that until we are in some tradition, in a Catholic tradition, you have to be baptized, and then and then you have the possibility of going to heaven. So there's nothing wrong with this. I'm not I'm not trying to criti critique it, but this is for most of us, for many of us in our society, and many people who come to Zen in, in the United States, have that as their, that's their working worldview. Um, and so, whether we're conscious of it or not, we have the sense of, uh, of when we enter the realm of religion, we're somehow flawed, and then we have to get towards or get to unflawed. That's kind of the schema that's built into our genes, our DNA has that in us. And it's very easy to transplant that kind of thinking into Zen and say, okay, here I am, this kind of deluded human being, and I'm going to reach for enlightenment. You know, it, it's just, it's natural. It's like a, a water in a river flows down a certain channel because the channel's there. That's the channel that's there for most of us. And so when we pour in spiritual water into that, it's going to go down that particular road. But uh, the, the channel, it's almost like we're cutting a new channel in. It's saying we start out, and it's not from an arrogant place. It's starting, we start out from being fully awake, fully enlightened, and then we move from there, and we deepen that. For, for me, a big part of it, you know, with training with a teacher, um, that meant um, looking at it, what my teacher helped. One of the things, one of many things that my teacher helped me with is one was to help me to ground, ground my practice. You know, I couldn't fool her with thinking like I. There's a tendency to think, oh, I've had a really neat experience or experiences. That must mean something. That must mean, you know, that's like your diploma or something. Yeah. And then you want your teacher to, like, verify. Oh, yeah, that's right. Good job. You got it. And she, she just never did that. She never did that. And in fact, I was embarrassed one time by her when I shared with her an experience I had. I was like, and she just was like, she just chuckled and laughed. and Or she would say to some people, what was the date on that? As if, you know, that has nothing to do with this moment now. And so the intention there was to ground, you know, to ground us back. You know, what's actually happening right now? What's your life about right now? And, one of the, and the, another thing that I learned from her, once, you know, you get out of this idea of having some kind of special state of mind, once you get out of that, you look at, well, how do I actually live my life? And where do I screw up? And a big part for me was um, my, my teacher would share that 
every job, every duty, every, everything that we do has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's a preparation period, there's a doing phase, and there's an ending phase. And our practice is to take care of all three of those. You know? So once the doing phase is done, then we clean up. And in order for the doing to be good, we have to prepare well. So there has to be some kind of preparation in any job. And you can think about that. In any job, there's those three phases. There's a preparation. Okay, i gotta prep. I got to prepare. And, and this could be for short-term things or it could be long-term. You know, what do, what do I need to do in order to get this job done? I gotta, I've got to think about, I've got to organize myself. I've got to plan, maybe. Maybe planning is a part of it. And then there's the execution. You do it. And then, and then the doing is determined by the first step, the organization. How you do will depend on how well organized you are. And then you can't just end with the doing. You have to let the doing go and clean up. You gotta sweep the floor. You gotta do the laundry. You gotta turn out the lights. You know, you gotta take down the flagpole. It's it's all all three of those are part of it. It's not just like one thing. Well, maybe we will pause, we'll push, press the pause button there, and we'll come back to this um, tomorrow. Okay, thank you. We'll do that. Closing. Wait, 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 wait. Let's, do that. let's do that together. Let's do that together. Yeah, all right. Ready? May this merit extend universally to all, so that we, together with all beings, realize the Buddha 